great. I'm Matt with OregonFlyFishingBlog.com. I'm here with Randy Dersham at Tapman Boats and Eagle Rock Lodge and WoodenBoatPeople.com. <laughs> and Too many oars in the yeah, water. Yeah, there's a lot of oars <laughs> in the water. And I want to, Randy, so talk a little bit about the operation here at Tapman. We, um, Sanderson and I, started uh, McKenzie River Drift Boats about two years ago because we had bought Eagle Rock Lodge. It turns out that the original builder of that building was one of the charter guide members of the McKenzie River Guides Association, and there was just a natural connection to it. And then uh, last July, we had the opportunity to purchase Tapman Wooden Boats and kind of merge what we had started off with a really well-established business, so we kind of have the two things going together. Now. Awesome. And you guys are going to be at the Federation of Fly Fishers show uh, up in March. What are you guys going to be doing there? We got conned into uh, trying to build a boat in two days. We have heard uh, there's a, a, a story about Keith Steele going back to the Smithsonian and building a boat in one day. Believe it or not, I'm not sure exactly how he did that, but uh, uh, the boat that's in the Smithsonian, the McKinsey River Drift Boat that's back there, was built by Keith Steele, one of the original builders here on the river. And the Federation of Fly Fishers asked us if we would put together a boat at the show, sort of as a, uh, a way to get together and talk about um, boats and attraction, whatever's going on. So we are uh, we're going to do our best to get a, a boat kit all uh, put together, get it all uh, prefabbed out, and then uh, do one day to do it uh, bottom up, and then turn it over and do the inside the next day, and they're going to auction it off on Saturday night. And you're going to be doing a kind of a smaller boat, like a one-man boat. Can you tell me like a little bit about that design? That Boat that design? particular boat we're doing is actually a 1648. We're oh, you're going to size. No, okay. it's a full meal so. deal. In fact, it's 16 and a half foot long by 50 inches wide. It's that uh, that special George Wrecker boat. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, uh, George thought the 1648 was a little too light for supersized customers. So it's just a little bit bigger, uh, but not too much. It's still really traditional. Right. Well, tell me a little bit about. WoodenBoatPeople.com and how that plays into the business. WoodenBoatPeople.com is a social site that we started up, uh, goodness, only a few months ago, really about the middle of November. Mm -hmm. uh, we grabbed what uh, is an off-the-shelf piece of software to help you put together a, a site for people that want to get together about a particular topic and uh, invited our friends that we knew that had wooden boats and it just started to grow from now. There, uh, now there's probably no, I think there's 113 members, and it's uh, it's seeing some very reasonable traffic, and there's probably probably most of the of the wooden boat builders on the west coast uh, are uh, are on the site as well. Yeah, it's a great site. Yeah. Definitely been checking it out. Uh, so, talk to me about the debate in wooden boat building. You, you mentioned high profile versus low profile boats, and oh, what people are stuck doing. There really is two major camps in wooden boats. Uh, if you are east of the Rockies and you don't have a lot of vertical grade, the rivers don't run as fast. And the biggest problem with your boats is that the wind blows hard. So if you get out in the Great Plains area, if you're in Wyoming or if you're on the Yellowstone, wind is your worst enemy. If you're here on the west, if you're anywhere west of the Rockies, your worst enemy, of course, is the speed of the water and the rapids that you have. So you have one kind of boat that is really optimized for uh, for running the white water, which is the most uh, traditional boat that we have here on the west for the Mickens River Drift Boat and the Rogue River Boats. And then you have the boats that are a little lower profile, uh, Rocky Mountain Prams or lower profile boats that are made for the low windage conditions. And of course, uh, in any state, you can probably find both pieces of water, so we prescribe that you have one of each. Right, one of each, of course. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the boats you guys are building today versus the you know prototypical McKinsey drift boat of the past, you know, the namesake. The boat we're building today has a lot of small changes, not big changes, small changes mostly in materials and a little bit in the way that uh, things are being put together with polyurethanes and with fiberglasses and different glues that they didn't have available in, in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, the design itself is not radically different. There are little bits of difference in design that optimize a boat for one set of conditions or another set of conditions, but those are still personal choices for people, the same personal choices they made then versus how they make them now. Do they want the boat a little wider so that it's not as tippy? Do they want it narrower so that it's easier to hold in the current? Those kinds of decisions are the same decisions today as they were in 1940. But the things we are doing different today is we're using much more space age glues, uh, polyurethanes that are much harder than ever before. So you can paint a, a wooden boat 
you can uh, put together a, a finish to allow the wood to show on the boat that protects the boat in different ways than it did in the 40s and 50s. Right. And what's what's the the person that comes to you, your average you know boat builder? What's their level of experience like with woodworking and boats? Uh, and, yeah. It really is all of the above. We have an awful lot of folks who are not afraid of, of building a boat at all. So if they're cabinet makers or they're folks who already have a big shop, they're really into woodworking and they've always thought they wanted to build a boat. Um, those folks will, will be the first ones into the door because they have no questions about it whatsoever. They know that they can do it. And in some cases, they just want to jump into it on, on their own. There are our other customer, and the one that we, we probably service the most often, is the person who knows they want to build a boat. They know exactly what it is that they want to do, but they don't have enough confidence or they don't have the equipment to cut out all the pieces. There are very few square joints on a boat kit. And in fact, most of the joints or most of the places from, from the top edge to the bottom edge of any particular piece actually curls. And um, traditional boat building would put a pattern up against that. You'd scribe a line on both sides, and then you grab your spoke shave, your razor knife, and just cut it to match the two. Today, we don't have to do that. We can do it with a computer controlled router and a program that designs exactly where it goes, but we're using high technology to do what the old guys used to do with a pattern transfer and a, and a knife edge, um, rather than just running it straight through a saw. So we're actually using high tech to build old school design. We use the CNC machine in order to cut out almost all of our parts. We still have a table saw. A table saw is a, a staple for any kind of wood shop. And some of the cuts that we make are straight cuts or a straight rabbit yes. cut that's just still faster and easier to do on the table saw or on the fixed router. But almost all of our pieces go here on the machine where we can design the boat in 3D and then we can put the 3D program into the computer, bring it over, and it runs the router on, on this machine. A step scarf, the bad thing about a step scarf is you've got a score and a straight step. And so most people that build will build with uh, a feathered edge out to the feather edge so that it doesn't pop off. We use the CNC router so it creates a step. So it's going, each step that comes down is goes about three thousandths of an inch when they pop down. And by having it curve, you never have a weak straight line. This is actually rocket science, believe it or not. Princeton University put together a, a thing on, on uh, connecting laminated materials and they were using, uh, they needed a way to scarf together graphite for the hulls of rockets. And this is where they came up with taking the graphite panels and doing a sinusoidal curve. So on the boat, look you have this pri pri prior to, uh, proprietary. It's not proprietary because it wasn't created by me. Right. It just, I don't know of anybody else who's doing it on the west coast right now. I know of one other boat builder on the east that's doing it. There's no reason why others couldn't. Um, it's just a little bit of extra work. It's one of the things that makes it be a really tight kit. It's great. And you can do it on thin material. Quarter inch. Because of the CNC. Four steps on quarter inch. The bottom one's only about 7,000 inch. All right. That's fantastic. What you guys are doing now with the most modern wooden boats to what was happening you know, with the debate of aluminum and fiberglass? Well, the biggest difference now is that wood used to not last nearly as long as, as aluminum or fiberglass. It was always considered to be the high maintenance boat. Uh, today, you can um, use polyurethanes and pretty much what you have is a fiberglass encapsulated boat. It's all covered. Um, it's all encapsulated and it's well protected, so you can wash the boat out. The one difference today that still exists is a wooden boat should be kept inside. Um, if it's outside, if it's in the weather, it's going to expand, contract, it's going to work on, it's going to be a little hard. Sun is always the worst enemy of any boat. So as long as you have a garage to put it in, today's boat would last a lifetime. Great. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. All right.